Hello everyone, welcome to Probability and Statistics for Data Science. Today we're going to talk about how to derive the distribution of a function of a continuous random variable, which is very useful for probabilistic modeling. Let's get to it. So again, the plan is we're going to explain how to derive the distribution of a function of a continuous random variable when we know the distribution of that continuous random variable and we also know the function. Let's remind ourselves uh, how we do this for discrete random variables. So we're going to call our deterministic function that we know h. And now if we have a discrete random variable a, the first question we need to ask is, is b defined as h applied to a, a discrete random variable? The answer is yes. We justified this um, in, the, in the video on discrete random variables and the probability mass function. So now how do we compute the probability of B, is, not the probability, the PMF, because remember that we describe discrete random variables using their PMF. How, we derive, how do we derive the PMF of B if we already know the PMF of A? Well, basically, we go to the definition of the PMF of B, which is that, here should have maybe put a little bit more detail, what is the PMF of B? It's just the probability that this random variable is equal to this specific value, right? But we can express that probability in terms of what we already know, which is h of a. So we just need to compute the probability that h of a is equal to this value, which we can do by summing over the relevant values of the PMF. Let's take a look at an example super quickly to just fix ideas. Imagine that we know the PMF of g, which is this goal differential that we already used as an example in our videos on discrete random variables and PMFs. And now we want to uh, derive the PMF of the points that will be gained by uh, a soccer team if there is this goal differential. So the points can be equal to zero if the team uh, loses, one if the team ties, and three if the team wins. So how do we compute this PMF? Again, by, by definition, the PMF at zero is the probability that the team loses, which occurs if there's this point differential. So we have to add 0 0.1 and 0 0.2. What's the, well, the probability that the, the team obtains one point is the probability that the team ties. So the goal differential is zero. So the probability is also 0 0.3. And then finally, what's the probability that the team wins? We have to consider all the possibilities, which is a goal differential of 1, 2, or 3. We add all that up, and we get 0 0.4. Okay, so pretty straightforward. We will see how we can do kind of the same thing, although it will get a little bit more complicated for continuous random variables. But before that, we have to ask ourselves, if we have a deterministic function h, and we apply it to a continuous random variable to obtain another random variable b, is this a valid continuous random variable? And the answer is that not necessarily, but this is a very, very mathematical, um, a very mathematical answer because in practice, an overwhelmingly, like in, in an overwhelmingly majority, overwhelming, why did I get into that? Most of the time, why do I need to be fancy and use the word overwhelming? Most of the time it will be, like when you're doing probabilistic modeling, it will usually be a valid um, continuous random variable, but let me explain why it might not be. For that, we need to go to the definition of continuous random variables and remember that mathematically, a random variable is a function from a sample space to the real line. What does that function need to satisfy? It needs to satisfy that the, um, the events that map to different intervals, so here we have two intervals, i1 and i2, the events of outcomes that map to those intervals have to be measurable, which means that there is a probability assigned to them. They belong to the collection in this underlying probability space. So it turns out that it can happen that if you have a function from the real line to the real line, I'm going to use maybe a blue, you have a function from mapping points from the real line to the real line, you can build that function such that then the composition of this function, which is the random variable, and this function that is h, you can build that so that this new random variable b that maps the sample space to the real line, you can actually build that in a very intricate way so that b is not 
um, measurable so that you, you cannot assign probabilities to the pre-images of the intervals. This is, I don't know how to do that, to be honest, but it can be done. If you're interested in this kind of details, um, you know, get a book on, on measure theory or take a course on, on advanced measure theory. For our purposes, in general, it is going to be a valid um, random variable, and that's what we're going to assume. Okay, so let's remind ourselves, how do we describe continuous random variables? There's two ways of describing continuous random variables. One is the CDF, which we usually denote with a big F, which tells us the probability that the random variable is in intervals that go up to a certain point. So here, this value, which is kind of 0 0.4 maybe, is the probability that the random variable is anywhere below that value. So that's why they go from 0 up to 1. Uh, as we discussed in the video on probability density, this doesn't really give you a very intuitive description of uh, what is happening locally with the random variable. Because of that, in, uh, we usually use, we often use the probability density function to describe the behavior of random variables. That's the derivative of the CDF, and it tells us how much density of probability there is in each part of, of space. So here we see that if we start sampling the random variable, we're going to see values here and here. Okay, Those are the two ways that we have to describe um, continuous random variables. Okay, so now let's go to our main question, which is we have a AH, a deterministic function. We have A, which is a continuous random variable with PDF, PDF F of A. Now we want to describe B that is equal to H of A. So we have two ways of describing it. How do we compute the CDF of B? Well, we do something that was that's very similar to what we did in the case of the discrete random variable. We go to the definition. What is the CDF of B at this value? It's the probability that the random variable is smaller or equal to that value. Now we can use the information that we have. We can plug in H of A because that's what this guy is equal to. Okay, that's why the that's what the, the random variable is equal to. And now that we have a probability and a, um, the probability of an event that depends on A, now we know how to compute this using the, the PDF of A. Right? How do we use, what do we do? We integrate over all the values for which H of A is more or equal to B. And that's how we can derive the CDF of B. We're going to see some concrete examples in a moment, but this is how we do it. Now, how do we compute the PDF of B, if that's what we really want, because we're interested in local behavior and so on? We just take the derivative of the CDF, as simple as that. So there are some formulas that will give you the PDF of B from the PDF of A. They can be proved in exactly this way. Me, I like to you know, go systematically first through the CDF and then differentiate, because those formulas might or might not hold depending on the, the properties of the, the deterministic function and also of the, of the PDF. Uh, actually, the properties of the deterministic function is what I meant. Okay, so let's take a look at an example. This example is inspired by the fact that I was an electrical engineering undergrad, and in Spain, we couldn't really choose courses for the first like three or four years. So I took like 20 courses on electronics and circuits and so on, and I remember absolutely nothing. This is essentially what I remember that uh, voltage is equal to re resistance times current. Uh, okay, so imagine that we have a random variable C that models the current in a certain electric circuit. Okay, we know the PDF of the current, but now what we're really interested in is the voltage across a particular resistor. Here, R is going to be a constant, which is the resistance of, of that resistor. Okay, so what do we do? Well, uh, we want we'll start we want the PDF of, of V, but we always start with the CDF because that's what has an interpretation in terms of probabilities that is going to make our life easy. So the CDF of B is just the probability that V is more or equal to any value on the real line. Okay? We do this for an arbitrary value. Sometimes it's useful actually to think about what that would be if you plug in like 0 0.5 here or 23 or whatever value. In particular examples, this can actually help you to to kind of um, figure out what that probability should be, and then you can do it for an arbitrary value. That's just a technique that, that is sometimes useful. Anyways, so now by definition, we can plug in the expression of V in terms of the random variable C because we know the PDF of C, right? So we plug that in, 
r is a constant, it's a non-negative constant, so we can just pass it to the other side, and we get the probability that c is smaller than, smaller or equal to v over r, which by definition is just the CDF of, um, of c. Okay, so now if we want the PDF of v, what do we do? We differentiate this. If we differentiate this, we have to differentiate this function. What's the, different, what's the derivative of the CDF? It's just the PDF. And we also have to derive whatever is inside, right? So there's going to be a 1 over r that is going to come out. And that's it. This is the, the PDF of the voltage across the resistor. Um, as an example, let's imagine that because we've, we've done this for an arbitrary PDFC, you can, this will hold for any possible PDF that the current may have. Let's imagine that the current is uniform between minus one and one. So now we have to apply this formula here. Realize that um, here we're plugging in V over R. So if the PDF of C is non-zero, in this case between minus one and one, the CDF of this guy, the PDF, sorry, of this guy is going to be non-zero when this is equal to minus one or is, sorry, this is between minus one and one, which happens between minus R and R. So we see that the um, uh, PDF is being uh, spread out if R is greater than one or um, compressed if R is smaller than one. So this is the picture. This is the, the PDF of the current. This is what the PDF of the voltage is going to look like. Okay, let's look at a more complicated situation where the function is not invertible because realize that back here, our life is kind of easy because at some point here, we can just essentially apply the inverse of this H function by dividing by R. And that gives us immediately the, the CDF of the new random variable that we're interested in. Here, we're not going to be able to do this because this is a, like the, the function that we're interested in is a square. So it's not invertible. It makes things a little bit trickier. So I didn't say this, but now what we're interested in is in deriving the distribution of the current, no, not of the current, of the power of uh, going, like being dissipated within this resistor, which is equal to R times the square of the current. I want to derive this the distribution of the power based on the PDF of the current. So at the beginning is going to be exactly the same. We start with the CDF of the power. It's just the probability that the power is smaller or equal to a particular value. Now we plug in the expression that we have for the current. And now we get an event in terms of the current. So we get an event that tells us that the square current is more equal to W over three. So now we, we could directly uh, integrate over that, or we can think a little bit and realize, or think a little bit about what the values of C should be so that C squared is smaller or equal to W over three. And you will realize that that happens when C is between square root of W minus, sorry, minus square root of W over three and square root of W over, over three. Why am I saying three over R? Did I, I don't know if I've, I've been saying three all the time. I meant R, obviously. Okay, so just to, I don't know, it's, it's a bit late in the day. Sometimes I, I just start saying whatever. So I hope it's obvious, like here, this event can also be written completely equivalently as this, right? So if C is between minus square root of W over R and square root of W over R, then the square of C is smaller or equal to W over R. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Now we can integrate the PDF over that, or we can realize that this is just equal to the CDF at this value minus the CDF at this value by the properties of the CDF. And now if we want the PDF of the power, what are, what, am I, what are we going to do? We're just going to differentiate the CDF, as simple as that. Okay, so what is this? We, we differentiate um, the CDF, that's just equal to the PDF of the current, which we actually know. And then we have to differentiate this thing. You have to know how to do the, dif the derivative of the square root. When I do this in class, I always get it wrong. I do it by hand in class. Here I'm not doing it by hand, so I'm not gonna get it wrong. But uh, what needs to come out is this because that's the derivative of this guy, okay? 
and then there's a minus so there's this why this becomes a plus so we get this kind of complicated expression which is the pdf at this value at square root of w over r the pdf at minus w square root of w over r and then we multiply it by this uh, quantity which is actually um proportional to one over square root of w so now if we look at an example where the current is flat is uniform the power is not going to be uniform if you apply that function you will see that now the power is not zero between zero and r and it has this shape because of this one over square root of w dependence that we have derived so this is actually no i wouldn't have expected this where if you just ask me the question of how is the pdf of the square going to look like okay all right so now to finish let's look at another example where i'm going to ask you a bit of a weird question what happens if we feed a random variable a into its own cdf and interestingly this actually question this question is pretty important if you're um, going to do statistics because it, it will help us to analyze p-values but we will do this much much later on for now you know think of this question we take a random variable a and we feed it into its own cdf what does that even mean well it means that we take the cdf and now i, I for a moment you're going to have to forget what the cdf means okay so we have the random variable a we could in principle draw its cdf okay as a graph because it's a cdf it's going to look something like this it will start at zero and eventually it will go to one and now this is a function right it means the probability for uh, the probability that a is you know anywhere up to here and so on but forget about that think of it as just a function g okay if this is a this is g of a if i get this value for a and i plug it into a function i get this value which is between zero and one you just think of it as a function and now what does this mean this b equals to the cdf applied to a it means that for every value I get from A, I just plug it into this function. Okay? It's a strange thing to do, but again, it's actually important to understand p-values, as we will see much later on. But for now, how do you even derive the distribution of this? Well, you, you do what we, we just did for, the, for our other examples, right? You say, okay, I want the distribution of B. And this is crucial to understand p-values. I already said that two times. Um, we're going to assume that the CDF of A is invertible, but you can actually apply uh, the same argument if it's not invertible. It just gets a little bit more complicated. But what do we do? We are very principled about this. We say we have this random variable B. We want the CDF of B. Okay. Um, if we want the PDF, then we will just differentiate this. By definition, that's just the probability that the random variable is smaller to is smaller or equal to any value on the real line okay so now we plug in the expression for b which happens to involve the cdf but here you just need to think of it as g of a for some a that we have decided to apply again for a moment we forget that the cdf has any meaning it's just a function the definition of b that is that it's that function applied to a we plug it in and now we wor worry about what is the probability that this function is more or equal to b we're going to apply the fact that the CDF is invertible. If it's invertible because it's monotone, uh, this event that the CDF is more than B is exactly equivalent to the to A being uh, smaller or equal to the inverse of B. Okay, because of the fact that the random variable is uh, the CDF, sorry, is monotone. Let me maybe draw a picture to make clear what we're talking about. So we have a CDF like that. What we're saying is, if we're interested in the probability that this would be, oops, this would be as like A, let's say, here. And this would be, so this would be a certain value B. If we want the probability that F of A Maybe I'll, I'll erase this because I think that was confusing. Okay, if we want the probability that f of a is here below b, 
that is exactly the same as the probability that A is here. Okay, and this actually I had, this is F minus one B. Okay, I hope that that makes sense. Why? Because this guy is monotone. So every time we map here, we end up there. We cannot end up here. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so um, we're interested in the event that the random variable A is smaller or equal to this value. Let's forget for a moment what that value means. You can, if you want, you can call this value C. So what is this probability? It's just the CDF at C. I plug in that value, and now we're going to use the fact that this is actually the inverse of the CDF, so that when we apply the CDF there, this just equals B. So this is telling me that for values of B between 0 and 1, because those are the values that you're going to obtain when you apply the CDF, right? The CDF is only going to give you values between 0 and 1. The CDF of this new random variable is equal to B, so basically, it's a, it's a line. If we take the derivative of this, we realize that the new random variable is always uniform, no matter what the distribution of the original random variable. So this transformation where you apply the CDF to a random variable always gives you the uniform distribution. And again, this is important because this is how we understand the distribution of p-values. All right, so how, what have we learned? We, we have learned how to derive the distribution of functions of continuous random variables. We always do the same thing. We uh, write down the CDF of our new random variable. Then we plug in the expression in terms of the old random variable. We work a little bit with that expression and eventually we differentiate it to get the PDF of the new random variable. And that's all I got. Thank you very much.